I'm just kidding. Uh, I offer you these reflections in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wait for the crying to subside. I, I like cribs. I like that babies go in cribs because cribs are like prisons. And when a baby wants to escape, they have to be really crafty to get over those bars. Um, and, and recently we took Isaac out of a crib for the second time. Uh, we tried once and failed. He beat us. So we tried again. Um, and he, he's doing a bit better this time. Um, but they can get out of their beds easily now. And our boys share a room. And when they're rolling around their beds at night, um, calling our names or making excuses to stay awake, Ambrose's fifth or sixth trip to the bathroom, then my response is a, a curt and gruff, try to go to sleep. And that doesn't work. Because I'm sure, as you know, sleep is one of those things that the more you try to find it, um, it always seems to get away. I remember many times when I was a kid trying really hard to get to sleep. And I would focus and grip my teeth and stare at the ceiling, only to find myself wired, completely awake, and not going to sleep anytime soon. Because sleep comes, when it does, like a gift that you don't ask for. It shows up when we stop trying to find it. And happiness is a lot like sleep in this respect. When we aim for a happiness, when we try to make our lives about searching for it and finding it, it never seems to appear. It's like trying to cup water into your hands, and the moment that you think you've got it in your palms, you realize it's dripping out onto your shoes. See, happiness isn't easy to find, and what's more, it really isn't worth finding at all. Let me explain. Uh, a prominent psychologist has pointed out recently in his new book that, that note, he, he notes that aiming to be happy is, is one of the worst things you can do with your life. And there's a, a bunch of reasons he lays out, but one of the reasons is because when you aim to be happy and find that circumstances outside of your control make your life miserable, not only do you feel miserable about being miserable, but you feel miserable because you failed in your quest to be happy. And so the depression is kind of compounded. Um, it's another thing that you haven't gotten right. But besides this, not finding happiness is actually, um, it's worse because happiness isn't really a goal worth aiming for. It's such like a fleeting thing. It's such a low thing to orient our lives around. Because... It, it, it doesn't really have a lot of meaning and so much depends on our circumstances that we can't control. And psychologists tell us this, but as Christians we wouldn't be surprised to learn this because we hear Jesus teaching his church all along. The same lesson. It's the, the story we shape our lives around as Christians that God became man and lived and died as one of us and then was raised to new life. The story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation leaves little room for happiness. There are a few instances here and there where it's talked about, but instead, it offers us something far richer, a life aimed at love, and then having found love, the deepest joy. See, if you scan through the whole Bible, you'll find that it doesn't know much about happiness. It's not central anyway. I mean, there's a few passages in Proverbs, like I said, or, or, or um, some of the Psalms kind of are these uh, happy expressions of praise. But, but, but what, what's the Bible about then, if happiness isn't the goal? I think the Bible tells us that our, our life is about far more than happiness. And in today's gospel passage, which we read like an hour ago, um, so if you have and, and, and want to look at it, you can look up in your pew Bible, John 15, it starts at verse 9, but if you have a good memory, not like me, then you can just call it to mind. Wow. Okay. Um, that wasn't said very well. Let me start again. In today's passage, Jesus tells his disciples, and he's telling us, that the single most important fact of our existence is that God the Father loves us. And he, he invites us to abide or live in this love. Well, how do we do that? 
Jesus says it's pretty simple. We keep the Father's commands. Because as a Christian, when we receive the love of God, we learn to abide in that love by doing what God commands us. We learn to actually take delight in his commandments. Uh, Psalm, the Psalms, psalmists talk about how they are sweet like honeycomb for us. They taste sweet to our souls. And this is really wonderful news because we don't have to figure out on our own what pleases God. We just simply receive his love and we follow the word he gives us in the Bible. And it not only teaches us what to stay away from, the things that will damage our lives and steal joy from us. The Ten Commandments are, are, are a great touch point for this. You know, don't murder people. That won't make you happy. Don't steal things. Don't be covetous. Don't commit adultery, etc. But God also gives us commands about things that we can do to please him. To honor our parents. To keep the Sabbath holy. To love justice and mercy and to care for the poor and needy. In short, we do all the things that Jesus does. If we need to sum up the whole Bible, it's in him. And he not only brings the Father's love to us in a concrete way, but he leads us in the way that's doing right and what, bring ple what brings pleasure to God. He's our, our role model. The things that Jesus does positively please his Father. And we don't follow him in order to keep God off our back because we're afraid of something, but we do what he does because we want to live in God's great love, a love that's all his initiative, that originates with him, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, as I was thinking about this passage this week, I felt like I needed to put the record straight about something, because there's an idea out there that commands are negative things. And so if, when I say the word command or when you read it in the Bible and it makes you cringe when you hear it, something has gone wrong. Because in John 16.11, which is really the key here, pardon me, 15.11, um, the key to understanding why Jesus gives us these commands, why he asks us to follow him in obeying the Father, it's, it's really fascinating. He says it's so that his joy might be in us. And so that our joy might be full or complete. Does that sound strange? That God gives us commands to bring us joy? I tried to think of an example to illustrate this. So, I, I, uh, I can't eat gluten because it makes me sick. But when I could, one of my favorite things was real sourdough bread. Not, not the kind that's packaged as sourdough bread but hasn't sat aging for a long time, but the real stuff where, you know, you can go to San Francisco and get it. It's, it's a different, different ball game. And, and if I told you, I want you to bake me the best sourdough bread I've ever tasted, and then I left you alone, unless you're like some kind of superstar chef like Cameron, um, you're not going to know what to do. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to fiddle around with pots and pans and, and, and ma measuring cups and flour. And, and eventually you're going to feel kind of despondent and hopeless. And you're not going to know what to do. It's not going to be happy. You're not going to be filled with joy. But on the other hand, think of how different it would be if I asked you to bake me the best sourdough bread that I've ever tasted. And then I handed you this detailed list of instructions. And then... I came with you, I walked you through the process in a hands-on way, I, I, I helped you learn the texture and the feel and the smells and the sights so that you knew what you were doing and helped you complete the baking process that way. I think it would still be challenging but a lot more enjoyable, a lot more encouraging and empowering and positive. See this is an image of our life with God. His commands are like the instructions to make good bread. And he gives us himself in Jesus. He takes on human flesh to show us what it means to follow them rightly. Jesus is the, the perfect example. And when we follow Jesus in this way, I think our lives are deeply filled with joy. And now, I didn't say that they'd be filled with happiness. Because life is terrible sometimes. And terrible things happen to us when we're Christians, sometimes because we're Christians. And it might be happy, and that's great, because those are wonderful times. But that's not the point, because joy is much deeper than happiness. Happiness is dependent on our outward circumstances that we can't control. But joy, on the other hand, comes from 
God's Holy Spirit working in us. And it's a lasting, deep in your bones knowledge that God is good, that however much suffering we face in life, no matter how terrible circumstances get, that we are beloved of God, that Jesus, his son, has given us more than we can ask or imagine. This is what joy is. Now, there's another point I want to tackle this morning really quickly because I've heard Christians say before that their faith is actually more about a relationship with God than rules and commandments and stuff like that. And it's important to be friends with Jesus rather than worrying about obeying all the commands of the Bible and, and all that stuff. And I, I think on the nose of it, that sounds right. There's something to that. But I think if we look more closely at what Jesus actually tells us in the Bible, if we read a little more carefully, we see that Jesus demonstrates his love for us by giving up his whole life. And we demonstrate our love for him by obeying his Father's commands. That is, if we really want to enjoy friendship with Jesus, if we really want to have a relationship with God, we, we obey him. And this is like obvious when we think about our other relationships, right? If you try telling your spouse, I haven't tried this before, so maybe you should try it first. <laughs> if you try telling your spouse you love them and, and then ignore whatever they ask you to do, it probably won't go over well. Or even worse, if uh, you tell your parents, youth, that you love them, but you don't intend on doing anything they ask you, I don't think it'll go over very well. Because that's not how real relationships work. We demonstrate our love by doing the things that our beloved asks us. We love them, so we want to please them. And there's another idea out there, too, that Jesus' commands are somehow at odds with the Father's commands, that the Old Testament commands are somehow in contradiction with the New Testament. Now, this isn't something that Christians believe, especially Anglicans, though, because it's wrong. It's not true. And it's so wrong that believing it can actually damage our souls. Because if you remember, Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing. And the God of the Old Testament is the same God as that of the New Testament. And Jesus says he comes to, to fulfill the law. He brings further clarity to it. He brings further clarity to the Old Testament. So, for instance, just as God commands us not to kill or co commit adultery, Jesus' teaching and instead of kind of um, contradicting this, actually sharpens it. He commands us, don't only refrain from these outward acts, but in your inner heart, don't even let yourself go there. So, yeah, don't murder people, but the, the root of this is when you hate someone, when you despise someone. That's, that's the root of murder. So don't even let your heart get there. Because the New Testament is the spirit of the Old Testament, and it's in complete harmony with it. They're different, and they have different emphases, but they're in complete harmony, like a, an orchestra where there's some instruments playing certain uh, kind of tones and other instruments playing other tones, where they come together to create something beautiful in harmony. I, I didn't use the correct music words there, I don't think, choir, I'm sorry. Um, but to paraphrase the Book of Common Prayer, the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, it says this in fancier language. The Old Testament is not contrary to the New Testament because in both Testaments, everlasting life is offered to us by Jesus, who is the only mediator between us and God because he is both God and man. In short, the whole Bible from beginning to end points to Jesus following him. So we're getting hungry. I'll make my last point. Getting down to the nitty-gritty, what does all this mean for our lives as Christians? I tried to think about this and, and to come up with some examples because sometimes it's too out there for me. And, and I think it basically means living the kind of life that Jesus lived as far as possible for us. So Jesus is our example here, but more than this, uh, as he says in this passage, he actually chooses us, and we learn in other passages of the Bible that he not only chooses us, but he empowers us with his Holy Spirit to bear fruit. So what does it look like? What does this love look like as we share our love for Jesus by obeying his commands and his Father's commands? Ultimately, the, the, the perfect example is that you'd lay down your life for someone. You'd lay down your whole life the way Jesus did on the cross. 
She'd give up everything in love for the other's good. And while that's our, our model, our high goal, the, the thing we fix our eyes on, in daily life it might look like this. This is how I, I thought about it. It might mean laying down a little bit of your life by befriending someone who is deeply annoying to you and to everyone else because you see past their awkwardness to the person that God loves. Or it might mean canceling some of your plans to help care for someone in your life who's sick, laying down your life a little bit and showing Jesus' love in that way. Or it might mean giving money to the St. Matthew's food cupboard. Every week, homeless people or people who don't have enough money to buy groceries come and, and, and get free groceries instead of buying that next piece of clothing or technology, laying down this little part of your life. These are practical things, and, and you can ask God prayerfully to, to show you what it might look like in your life. But these little things is the start to obeying the Father's commands and living in this relationship with love with Jesus. So, this is the last time I'll probably get to talk to you on a Sunday. We'll be here for at least a couple more weeks. But uh, it's kind of sad, bittersweet. Um, and to move away from all of you who we've come to love so deeply and, and our children deeply, who are maybe even harder to love than us sometimes. <laughs> and I, I kind of wanted to say something like really profound and, you know, gotcha at the end. But I couldn't really think of anything. And, and as I started to think, I thought, you know what? I, I'm just happy that I got to talk about the Bible with you. Because my goal has always been and always will be to just convey, to preach the word of God, Jesus Christ, as faithfully as possible. And in my many ways, I fall short of that. But I, I've tried to do that today. And what greater honor and, or privilege could I imagine than to be humbled with this great task? To share God's word with you. So I ask you to pray for our family. Really, don't just say you're going to pray for us if you're not. I won't say I'll pray for you if I don't. I'll make sure I do. And uh, pray that we'd be able to be faithful to God's word in every way. Because that's, that's what we want. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.